the government would not give them their own reservation in California. So the Modocs, led by Captain Jack, also known as Kittipuith, returned to the old territory illegally. This shows a lady in the uh, Modoc tribe, a flower. And what's the next one? <coughs> this is about Captain Jack. Okay. Um, anyway, go forward to the map. I want to point out on the map, this is a map, if you'll see the line going across, that's the line between Oregon and California. Now, my understanding is, is the Modoc tribe had primarily lived south of the California border, and this was their home uh, territory. But many of the people that had settled in the area didn't want the Indians there, and they demanded that they move to a reservation, which was north in Oregon, and they had to settle with a different tribe of Indians, which they didn't get along with. So thus it started this um, battle between, uh, they came back to Northern California, and then the army was sent in to try to, to take care of this. And one of the problems, as I'll read here, was that uh, he soon faced the Modoc tribe who had previously lived in Northern California and was compelled to live in Oregon. And then the government would not give them their own reservation in California. So the Modocs, led by Captain Jack, also known, uh, <laughs> returned to the old territory illegally. The Modocs entrenched in Captain Jack's stronghold south of Thule Lake and they resisted army attacks fighting to a stalemate. The federal government authorized a peace commission assigned Candy as the key position in it, and his purpose in the commission was to was, was undermined by the fact that there were so many lines of communication between the Modocs and the whites. At one point, someone in touch with the Modoc leader, Captain Jack, alleged that the governor of Oregon intended to hang nine Modocs, apparently without trial, as soon as they surrendered. And this caused the Modocs to break off scheduled talks and infuriated Canby because he believed that the federal authority trumped the governor's uh, authority and made the threat irrelevant, but they surrendered to him. Canby had no intention of allowing the Modocs to be punished without a trial. So on April 11th, 1873, after months of false starts and canceled meetings, General Canby went to another party, unarmed, and with hope of a final resolution. The talks were held halfway between the Army and Cabot and Captain Jack Stronghold near Lake Tule. Two members of Canby's party brought concealed weapons, but even more, the Obodocs were very well armed. Frustrated by negotiations, Captain Jack, along with one of his lieutenants, shot Canby twice in the head and cut his throat. He was the first and the only general killed during the Indian Wars. He was only 55 years of age. Other members of Canby's party were killed, including, including Reverend Elazare Thomas. But still others were wounded. Following Canby's death, there was severe backlash against the Modocs. Eastern newspapers called for bloody vengeance against, except for one newspaper in Georgia, which headlined the story, Captain Jack and Warriors Revenge the South by Murdering General Canby, one of her greatest oppressors. In contrast, citizens of Richmond, Virginia, where Canby was actually serving as a military governor, met on April 18th to express their appreciation for Candy and sorrow of his death. After the funeral services at, on the West Coast, Candy's remains were returned to Indiana and buried in the Crown Hill Cemetery, Indianapolis, on May 23rd, 1873. Attending the final funeral services was at least four Union generals, William Tecumseh Sherman, Philip Sheridan, Lou Wallace, and Irvin McDonald, the last two serving among the pallbearers. Eventually, Captain Jack and others were tried for murder and executed on October 3, 1873. The Modocs were sent to the reservation. <laughs>
having been a military wife myself, and have, we were stationed in California, not very far from where this whole event took place. So I got to thinking what, more about his wife, Louisa. Now, of course, Richard's story wouldn't be complete without Louisa's participation. Uh, Louisa Hawkins can be, and as you, may, as you may remember when I said before, she was a Kentucky girl too, born down in Paris, Kentucky, and then she married her handsome general. As mentioned earlier, um, she was a graduate of Georgetown Female College, so she joined him on his assignments, his military assignments, with the exception of the Mexican-American War. That was just pretty dangerous for uh, family members to uh, accompany their uh, military folks. In his memoirs, William Tecumseh Sherman recalls the arrival of the Canbys at Monterey, California in early 1849 when Canby took command uh, of the military department of California. Now, the, at that time, they had a six-year-old daughter, Mary, and she died in childhood. But uh, their, her parents took up residence in uh, Monterey, which was then, of course, the military headquarters for California. During the two years that they were in that territory, uh, California applied for statehood. Both Canbys contributed to this effort uno uh, unofficially. Mrs. Canby copied documents for the statehood convention, and Major Canby, who was a major at that time, by arranging and partially indexing the territorial records. And you remember that he was fluent in Spanish as well as in English, so he was really a good one to uh, uh, have uh, taken care of the territorial records. Now, while her husband fought Sibley, his arch enemy, in the pitched Battle of Valverde, Louisa awaited the outcome of the campaign in Santa Fe, which was the territorial capital. On March 2, the Confederates captured Albuquerque, and eight days later, they took Santa Fe, where she was living. The Federal Army and the territorial government had evacuated the capital, burning and hiding any supplies that they were unable to carry with them to Fort Union, which was east of Santa Fe northeast actually. Louisa, along with the wives and families of other Union officers, chose to remain behind. They soon had misgivings, not for fear of the approaching rebel army, so much as because of the evacuation of territorial authorities had encouraged looters and other criminal elements. So whereas they had always felt pretty safe, uh, the, the group of wives and families, now they had another reason to be afraid. The Confederates entered Santa Fe on March 10, 1862, and established martial law, as he would expect them to, and then they conducted a mostly fruitless search for hidden supplies. On March 29, 1862, Confederate forces returned to Santa Fe from a victory won at an excessive cost at Glorieta Pass. On their way back to attack Fort Union, the Confederates had met a force made up predominantly of inexperienced Colorado uh, volunteers. While the, volunteer, while the Confederates had won a, territory, a technical victory, a unit of about 500 Coloradans had gone behind the Confederate lines and destroyed more than 70 wagons loaded with the Confederate food and gear. Without sufficient provisions to lay siege to Fort Union, the rebels had no alternative but to retreat. Now it was late winter, snow was falling in the region. Without even enough blankets to keep their sick and wounded warm, the bedraggled Confederates who returned to Santa Fe were, were, were a pitiable sight. So Louisa Canby, wife of this uh, general, uh, United States general, went to visit the wounded and was so moved by their suffering that she revealed the hidden storage of blankets and turned her home into a field hospital. She personally led a, a hastily organized company of nurses, these nurses were the wives of the other union's officers, to take care for the sick and dying men. 
and then she made trips to outlying encampments to bring her patients into Santa Fe, or failing that, to treat them in the field for the soldiers who could be brought into uh, the city. Louisa was nicknamed the Angel of Santa Fe for her compassion toward the, the uh, suffering Confederate soldiers. One rebel said, Mrs. Candy captured more hearts of the Confederate soldiers than the old general ever captured Confederate bodies. <coughs> that way, girls. <laughs> it was not until April 1 or 2 that General Sibley, who'd been at Al Albuquerque most of this time, arrived at Santa Fe, and then he personally met with Louisa and thanked her for caring for his men. And then they reminisced about their earlier encounters when he and her husband had been on the same side. Could Louisa's action have been interpreted as giving, giving aid and comfort to the enemies? Well, understanding what consequences did occur, it is necessary to examine the context of her behavior. In comparisons to other campaigns in the Civil War, and especially in light of the ill treatment of prisoners of war at Andersonville by the Confederates and at Camp Douglas by the Federals, the conduct of the New Mexico campaign was generally chivalrous. Truces were honored after each of the campaign's two major battles, and prisoners of war were usually freed or paroled after brief captivity. General Canby himself personally set a high standard. After interviewing several former POWs, one Confederate sergeant concluded that all who had fallen into Canby's hands had been well treated. In this context, Louise's compassion can be seen as consistent with her husband's policies. As mentioned earlier, following the Civil War, General Canby was retained was, uh, Canby was retained by the Army as one of only 10 Brigadier Generals and served as a military commander for various districts throughout the South with Louisa at his side. In an 1873 newspaper article, Mrs. Lou Wallace, that General's wife, uh, would recall that Louisa practiced charity, tending to give things away to the needy wherever she went in the South, endearing herself to the local populace but at some cost to her household. I can hardly keep anything. There's just so much suffering about us, Louisa wrote to General Wallace from New Orleans. Shortly before his death, Richard had written frankly to Louisa about his apprehensions over the negotiations with the Modoc Indians. The chief concern, which proved to be prophetic, was that Captain Jack so feared treachery that he might be capable of committing tre treachery preemptively. On the day of his death, Canby received a letter from his wife who was in Portland then. She had written, I think over all sorts of Modoc treachery until I'm becoming a nervous, hysterical woman and will have to get away from Oregon to get over it. Louisa found her husband's death so unbearable that she spent a week in bed. His body was shuttled from place to place for more than a month before it reached Indianapolis and was finally buried in Crown Hill Cemetery. And there you can see his gravestone. With the support of her brother, Colonel John Hawkins, Louisa devoted the last 16 years of her life promoting the memory of her husband. Now, the people of Portland, Oregon, upon learning of the, the size of the pension that the general's widow would get each month, $30 a month, which was increased to 50 by a special act of Congress a year later, but at the time, it was only 30 and 